Okay, it looks like we're at the top of the hour, so I think we'll go ahead and get started on our webinar series. This is Bill Johnson, uh, Extension Weed Scientist at Purdue University, and I'm your host for this week. Thank you all for joining us today in the fourth installment of the Take Action webinar series. This series is designed to bring you valuable information on weed and herbicide resistance management topics. It's a collaborative effort with the Take Action program and several land-grant university weed scientists. Joining us this week, we'll have Dr. Tom Peters and Dr. John Wallace. Before we begin, I'll provide a little more information on the Take Action program. Farmers' freedom to operate is threatened by the increase and spread of pesticide resistance. The consequences include short-term and long-term economic challenges, decreasing land values, the uncertain regulatory pathway to access crop protection tools, crop losses, and other challenges. Take Action is a farmer-focused education platform designed to help farmers and their advisors manage herbicide, fungicide, and insecticide resistance. The goal is to encourage adoption management practices that lessen the impact of resistant pests and preserve current and future crop protection technology. Take Action is brought to you by Soybean Checkoff Dollars. For more information on Take Action, visit www.iwilltakeaction.com. As a reminder for these webinars, you may submit questions in your chat box throughout the presentation. We will allocate time to address them at the end of both presentations. Our first presenter today is Dr. Tom Peters. Tom is an extension sugar beet agronomist and weed control specialist at North Dakota State University and the University of Minnesota. He supports farmers growing sugar beet in Minnesota, North Dakota, and Eastern Montana. His interests are integrated weed management, including nurse and cover crops and in row cultivation complementing pre and post herbicides in sugar beet and crops in sequence with sugar beet. Dr. Peters joined North Dakota State University and the University of Minnesota in 2014 following a 25 year career at Monsanto in St. Louis. Tom is a Minnesota native, received his bachelor's degree in agronomy and soil science at the University of Minnesota, MS degree from the University of Nebraska and PhD from North Dakota State University. Tom, I'm going to turn the floor over to you. Thank you, thank you, Bill. Um, I am calling, as Bill indicated, from balmy Fargo, North Dakota, where I don't see any sign of spring yet as I look out of my window. So I want to uh, elaborate a little bit more on, on sugar beet before we get started. Sugar beet is grown on approximately 1.1 million acres in the United States, so I would consider it a small acres crop. Um, likewise, um, the area of sugar beet production is, is in a few regions within the United States. So I'm fortunate to work in the largest sugar beet growing region. Um, our area in, in Minnesota, in eastern North Dakota and western North Dakota and eastern Montana is about 650,000 acres of, of sugar beets. So one other important point I want to make is sugar beet growers grow sugar beets in rotation with corn, soybean or dry bean and small grains. So we're interested in an integrated system where we can utilize the benefit of, of, of multiple crops and potentially multiple herbicides or other strategies within crop to control weeds. So 100% um, of our acres are planted using the Roundup Ready trait. The trait was developed during the 1990s and commercialized in, in 1998. That stated we have um, a number of glyphosate resistant weeds. So we have four of them. We have giant ragweed, common ragweed, kochia, and water hemp. I, um, in terms of which is the most important or which is the most difficult um, to control, it depends. It depends on what area you're in. But approximately 50% of our growers would state that pigweed and most of the time water hemp is their most important weed thread in sugar beets. 
And by the way, in our area, we do not have any Palmer amaranth yet. So our pigweed challenges are, are primarily water hemp with um, some acres, not a lot of acres of red root pigweed. Our weed control strategy is to use a layered residual program. So this is the same program that soybean growers might use. And, and the illustration on the screen indicates the way the program works. And this was developed by Dr. Hartzler at Iowa State University, this, this, this cartoon. So the idea is to use layered applications of soil residual herbicides. The idea being to have the layer activated in the soil before the weed threat starts to germinate and emerge. And then at the end of the season or before canopy closure to use a post-emergence herbicide to finish off or to close uh, and eliminate any uh, weeds that have emerged. Unfortunately, in sugar beet, we have, excuse me, I'm going to go back one. Bill, can we go back one more slide? Can we go backwards? Well, we're going the wrong direction. I'd like to go the other direction, Bill. Let me just let's just stay here, Bill, and and I'll I'll talk about the previous slide. Uh, unfortunately, we have escapes every season in our fields. The escapes we have don't interfere with harvest, but what they do do is provide a source for seed that we have to contend with for um, future years. So one of the ideas that we have been using. One of the ideas that we've been using to control weeds is um, um, the use of the electric discharge system. And this isn't a new idea at all. It's an idea that was developed during the 1980s. Um, the idea is to generate electricity from the tractor itself and then to transfer that electricity to a copper bar. In this case, the bar is located on the back of the unit. So as the tractor moves through the field, the bar will contact different weed species. So the idea being for the weeds to be above the crop of interest. When the weeds touch the bar containing the electricity, electricity transfers into the plant and it, it, it heats the plant. So I'm not exactly sure how much temperature change occurs, but there is enough temperature change to um, burst vascular bundles. And what we see is an immediate wilting phenotype in the field. This equipment was developed during the 1980s. Um, it was developed in, in uh, Grand Forks County, North Dakota. And it was widespread for about 10 years time. What we found with the equipment though is it was not very reliable. There was a lot of challenges with uh, equipment maintenance. And we also had challenges with, with um, um, safety. You know, we're using um, high voltage electricity and there were some challenges with that. So in terms of weed control, um, it depended. So if um, on, on species that had a central, a main central stem, we had very good control. However, on grass species or species that were highly branched, we had less control. This is data that Dr. Dexter developed um, during the 19, early 1980s to, um, to illustrate that point. Um, this is an example of, of, of the weed control that we saw. These are slides that I had digitized, so sorry for the, the quality of the image. Um, one of the things that you'll see in the image is 
um, and I'm starting on the upper left-hand side, um, a plant with a, a main stem was the easiest to control. On the picture on the right-hand side, it, it's kochia control. Kochia is a highly branched plant, and you can see that control was not as good in this in this situation. And part of that is due to the density, and the second is related to the biology of the weed itself. So like any equipment that's running um, in a heavy infestation, the generation equipment would run at a faster rate, and it would be common for the equipment to overheat and, and then not work properly. And I think that's indicative of, of what you see in the picture. Next slide, Bill. Another strategy that was used by growers was to use um, multiple applications of the equipment. So what I mean by that is using the equipment in one direction and then maybe uh, another direction. And this is a, a, an intuitive concept because weeds are continuing to grow. So the data would indicate that multiple passes of the equipment through the, through the field gave gave better control than, than a single pass. Next slide. So I want to say a, a couple of points just to conclude this, part of the, this portion of the presentation. Um, control of weeds with a main central branch were better or was better than highly branched weeds. Um, number two, it was easier to control weeds when they were scattered in the field versus in a, a dense population. Um, multiple passes in the field were better than a single pass. And as I mentioned, there were challenges with the equipment um, where the generation equipment would overheat and then disable. And, and then the other thing I want to state is because the weeds have to be over the canopy and we needed conditions where weeds were turgid, where there was moisture in the weeds, the number of operating days to use this equipment was relatively limited. The final um, point here, it's a citation. So there was work done to better understand the energy requirements of this equipment. So if anybody is interested in that, um, the citation might be of use. Next slide. Now, um, there's some new equipment, and this is going to be the remainder of my talk. I'm going to talk about this new equipment. The machinery is called the Weed Zapper, and it's developed by uh, a company that's based in Sedalia, Missouri. So there's three points that are unique about this equipment as compared to the previous version. First of all, the boom is mounted on the front of the equipment, so it's easier for operators to manage, um, to raise and, and lower as it passes through the field. Second, the safety equipment is, is much improved from the original version. And third, the number of watts of electricity or the, the power generation is much greater than the previous generation. Next slide, Bill. Okay, I want to go to a video that's on the bottom of the slide here. And this is done by the manufacturer, and it'll give you an example of the, the weed zapper passing through the field. So you can see the equipment is operated at approximately four miles an hour. And as it contacts weeds, you can see the transfer of electricity from the copper bar into the weed itself, and it puts on quite a show. And as I mentioned a moment ago, the, the phenotype that you see in the field is an immediate wilting phenotype. Next slide. Now, um, the story here is about electricity. And I, I want to just explain for a moment how electricity works. So. One of the adjustments that you can make on the machinery is the amount of voltage. So think of voltage as the force. Um, there's three levels. One might be for small weeds or a scattered density. Um, the second level might be broad, broadleaf weeds that are more branched. 
and the third level would and it would represent the highest level of voltage would be grassy weeds or weeds at a higher density. Amperage is the, the volume. So think of it, if you're thinking about water, think of water through a garden hose versus a fireman's hose. So the amount of, of, of water that passes through is, is measured by amperage. And then finally, voltage or wattage. Wattage is the power production, and this is voltage times amperage. So from what I understand from the manufacturer, amperage remains approximately the same, but as I indicated, voltage changes depending on what the weed challenges are. With the maximum amount of watt, wattage that you can produce at approximately 200,000 watts. Next slide. So there's a couple of field pictures that I'd like to show. Um, and this is from my own experience in 2019 in, in North Dakota and Minnesota. So when you pass by a field where the machinery has been used, you can see the brown, brown stems. And the picture on the bottom shows um, exactly what I mean by that. So um, in this case, it's water hemp, and it's completely controlled by the, um, by the machinery. The picture on the right, occasionally you'll see um, a stem where a portion of it is, is brown or black, and then a portion of, the, of it is still growing or still green. Next slide. When I, when I examined those slides or those plants, um, there were occasions when you would see, see a, a, a flowering structure. So one of the things that we know about water hemp is, is water hemp has this great ability to make seed. There are occasions when producers will pull the weeds, throw it on the, the, the ground, and the plant is still able to produce some seed. So I was concerned if, if we were indeed killing these weeds and in eliminating seed production, or if there was still a small residual amount of seed production that was still occurring. Next slide, Bill. So we did an experiment. We collected some seed from, from three different fields. Um, we, we dried the seed, we conditioned the seed, and then we divided it into 50 seed aliquots. And we planted the seed in the greenhouse. And we compared the seed where the field had been treated with the EDS equipment to control seed, which happened to be some seed that was on the edge of the field. So what I found is that the amount of germination, the number of plants that germinated, or the percent of, of, of the total population in the sample was very small where the equipment was used in the field. However, you can see from the data, there still is a, a very low frequency of germination that's occurring. And I think it, 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 it demonstrates that if we're going to use this type of equipment, we have to do it in a very timely manner and, 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 and make the application before um, plants begin to produce seed. Next slide. So what I want to summarize from our experiences so far, and, and this is from the 2019 experience, um, multiple passes are still relevant with this equipment. Um, water hemp grows in fields at multiple growth stages, so the multiple passes include um, ensure control of, of multiple flushes. So we've been using a seven to 10 day interval between those. Um, we're using the, the equipment at approximately five miles an hour. And what we've seen that the equipment is very effective at, at, at killing weeds. But I want to make the point here, weed interference is still occurring in fields because the weeds are, are they need to grow above the canopy before we can control them. So the idea of the equipment is to prevent seed production from occurring. So with that in mind, we're using this equipment as a post herbicide in the scenario that I mentioned earlier, and we're continuing or will continue to use our soil applied herbicide program as the base 
part of the, the weed management system for water hemp control and sugar beets. Bill, that's my last slide. Um, I want to thank everybody for their support. Thank you for supporting agriculture. And my contact information is in the next slide, Bill, if you want to go to that. If anybody has any questions about um, anything that I've stated, either send me an email or, or call me, and I'll be happy to help you. Thank you. OK, uh, thanks, Tom. So again, uh, Tom's contact information is shown here. Uh, feel free to snap a picture of that or, or write it down. And uh, we'll get ready for our, our next speaker. Our next speaker is Dr. John Wallace. John is an assistant professor of weed science and extension specialist in field and forage crop systems at Penn State University. He received graduate degrees in environmental science at the University of Idaho, where he focused on invasive weed ecology and management. He has been in his current position since 2018. John's extension and research program focuses on developing best management practices for new weed control technologies, developing integrated weed control tactics and systems-based approaches for weed management within conservation ag systems and rotational no-till organic field crop production systems. So John is going to uh, present his topic on integrating cover crops for herbicide resistance management. John, I'll turn the, the floor over to you. All right, well, thanks, Bill, for the introduction. Um, thanks for the Take Action Network for supporting these webinars. I've, been, I've enjoyed uh, tuning in the past couple uh, weeks. Let's see if we can get to the right slide here. There we go. Um, so my presentation is going to focus on uh, really the potential for optimizing the use of cover crops to improve herbicide resistance management. And I'm going to draw on work that we've been doing here in northeastern cropping systems and also uh, point to some good examples uh, in, the, in the Midwest and the Mid-South. So I'm going to start and, and finish really with the take-home points that I'd like to make today. Um, so first, I, I think both the, the land-grant research that's out there and experienced by some of the growers uh, demonstrate that cover cropping can be an effective tool um, and a systems approach to resistance management. So much like the weed zapper, it's a tool in the integrated weed management toolbox, and we'll get more use out of cover crops. Um, excuse me. We're gonna get more use out of cover crops if we understand uh, how they can be integrated with other weed control tactics. Um, so the second point I'd like to make uh, is that while there's good examples of how cover crops can control or manage current herbicide resistant weed species, we should really be thinking about how to employ cover cropping as a, a proactive approach that helps prevent the evolution spread of, of resistance to our currently effective herbicides. And so it's important to note here that oftentimes investing in additional weed management tactics to today to prevent resistance issues tomorrow or in the future is a tough uh, sell from an economic standpoint. But unlike many of the other weed control tools that we have available to us, cover crops uh, contribute or have the potential to contribute to multiple benefits, uh, multiple ecosystem services that we care about, like soil conservation and soil health. Um, and so my last uh, take home is that uh, to be effective, um, really we have to employ general management principles for cover crops and weed suppression that really have to be adapted to local conditions and constraints. So to suppress weeds, we, we first need to grow a weed suppressive cover crop. And that's often the grand challenge, um, depending on the rotation that you're in, soils, local environmental conditions. And so I'm gonna start by talking about some of these general management principles and then describe proactive resistance uh, management goals and then, and then share some examples from some studies. So um, we know that both living cover crops and cover crop mulches that are left on the surface can suppress weeds uh, due to a number of different competitive interactions that influence weed seed dormancy, germination, as well as uh, seedling establishment. Um, but when it comes to optimizing weed suppression potential from cover crops, we think about two things, cover crop quantity and as well as quality. And so 
higher biomass production and ground cover levels um, generally are going to result in higher levels of weed suppression, whether we're talking about a fall sown cover crop suppressing winter annuals in that shoulder season, or if we're talking about surface mulch suppression of summer annual weeds uh, in the crop phase. And so in the case of using surface mulches, uh, cover crop quality is also important because it influences uh, the persistence of, of the mulch through the growing season. Um, so in general, monocultures of, of winter cereals result in greater mulch persistence uh, in comparison to legumes because they produce higher C to N ratios. And that slows the decomposition rates of the mulch um, and, and creates a more persistence mulch. And, and um, so the C to N ratios in winter cereal, cereals, though, are really a function of growth stage. So the ratios increase as cereal, cereals head out or go through that stem elongation uh, process. And so both the cover crop species selection as well as potentially cultivars that differ in time to maturity can influence uh, cover crop quality uh, and, and mulch persistence, the things that we care about. So if the goal is to increase cover crop biomass production and increase the persistence of, of a surface mulch, what are, the, what are the management factors that we can adjust? And so there's a couple of considerations here. The first uh, is to find ways in the rotation to lengthen the cover crop growing season window, either by seeding earlier or terminating later. And in general, the longer the growing season window, the greater the biomass uh, potential. And so um, short cover crop growing season windows and corn soy rotations across the Corn Belt, parts of the upper Midwest, uh, parts of the, the, the Northeast are, are really the biggest challenge to both optimizing the weed suppression potential of cover crops and really just generally seeing adoption of cover crop cropping more broadly uh, in our crop systems. Um, so another consideration is, is the seeding and termination method. Um, so that can influence the weed suppression potential. In general, drilling a cover crop uh, is gonna probably uh, improve establishment rates relative to broadcast seeding methods. Uh, we also think that in the mulch system, roll crimping cover crops is gonna likely improve the early season weed suppression potential uh, relative to leaving, leaving that cover uh, standing. And so the last um, consideration is cover crop species selection, so establishing cover crops um, after late harvested grain crops typically is going to limit the number of species that we have available and we rely pretty heavily on those few winter cereals uh, in that cover cropping window like cereal rye or winter wheat or triticale. And so while there's uh, interest and a lot of support for using cover crop mixtures to achieve kind of multiple management objectives or ecosystem services, uh, recent research has really demonstrated that using a good wheat suppressive monoculture like zero rise can uh, result in, in equal or higher wheat suppression levels uh, than a lot of the mixtures. Uh, I, I want to add a couple more notes on the use of winter cereals like zero rye. So I know my personal experience in my research and I think uh, a host of studies pretty consistently demonstrate that um, soil and environment factors are oftentimes a larger driver of rye biomass potential uh, relative to other management tactics like seeding rates. So uh, there's a couple of considerations there. Certainly fall planting date matters. Uh, we consistently uh, hear from kind of our leading edge cover croppers or avid cover croppers in the Northeast that their MO is to chase the combine uh, out of the field with a, a drill full of cover crops. And so every day matters in the fall. Um, but in our region, um, in, in our weather patterns, delaying a cover crop termination by 10 to 14 days in spring, so maybe from early April to, to May, um, uh, can often make up for about a three to four week difference in fall planting dates when it comes to biomass production. Um, and so, and then the last thing is the other factor that may go unnoticed oftentimes is uh, the residual nitrogen availability in the fall. So the previous crop uh, in the rotation um, and the fertility source is going to influence the biomass potential. So here in the Northeast, we in, in dairy systems, our manured soils oftentimes have a higher pool of residual N at the end of a crop 
that, that's going to help realize uh, the biomass potential of a winter cereal. And that might not be the case in other regions and production systems that are relying on synthetic inputs or precision uh, nitrogen management. So uh, this picture uh, set does a, a nice job, I think, of illustrating the interaction between management tactics like species selection and then soil environment factors. So uh, the columns are, are, are different um, species of cover crops uh, seeded in mid-September. And across the, the rows, you have uh, a lower fertility N situation in the top row, a higher N fertility uh, scenario in the bottom row. Um, and so if cover cropping, or if our goal is to maximize biomass production and uh, ground cover, you can see that we're only achieving uh, good biomass production and, and, and really high levels of ground cover uh, in those higher nitrogen fertility systems. Um, but certainly species selection uh, does make a difference as far as uh, getting those weed suppressive um, uh, cover crops. Okay, so there's also a, a couple general rules of thumb when we consider how different weed species respond to cover cropping strategies. So generally we think that uh, grasses establish more successfully in, in mulch residues than broadleafs, but um, beyond these taxonomic differences, things like dormancy factors, germination cues, and even the size of the seed or the seed mass are important factors. So weed suppression potential of, of cover crop mulches is generally higher with small seeded species that, that germinate in response or are sensitive to changes in, in light quality or quantity. And so mulches can dramatically reduce uh, light quantity or quality. Whereas larger seeded species are more likely to be insensitive to light conditions when it comes to germination. And they also have uh, higher energy reserves to really grow through that mulch and, and get established. Uh, so the and the other major factor um, is, is that influences weed suppression potential of cover crops is is probably weed emergence timing. So in general, uh, weed species that um, with peak germination periods that either overlap with the cover crop growing season window in the spring or the autumn, uh, or have peak levels uh, of germination that co-occur with uh, when we have the greatest levels of, of cover crop mulch on the surface are going to be more vulnerable to to uh, to those uh, cover crops. And so uh, weed species with long germination periods or with later germination periods in the crop season, um, which is certainly the case for things like palmer amaranth and water hemp, are probably going to be more challenging to control at high levels with things like a cover crop surface mulch. So then these figures, I think, do a nice job of illustrating how weed species responses differ uh, as a function of both quantity and quality. So on the left panel, we have total weed biomass in the y-axis, which is broken down by species. Um, so pigweed, foxtail, and ragweed. Uh, on the x-axis, we have three cereal rye termination dates from uh, late April to early May, which is about the time that we're planting uh, soybean or, or corn uh, in Pennsylvania, and the corresponding rye biomass at termination. And so delaying termination by about three weeks uh, in this study increased the total biomass production uh, by about 50%, and it also reduced total weed biomass uh, in the cash crop by about 60%. And so if you look at how that differs across the weed species, um, red root pigweed in this case uh, is, is the later emerging species relative to those other ones. And so we see a more significant effect of delaying termination on red root pigweed, which is likely due to both greater levels of mulch and longer persistence uh, in the crop. The right panel, we have total weed biomass in the y-axis uh, and different seeded ratios of cereal rye and, and hairy vetch on the x-axis. Um, and so what stands out here is that we see a spike um, in weed biomass in the pure hairy vetch monoculture. And so why is that? It's, it's likely due to less persistence of the legume, so it breaks down or decomposes uh, uh, quicker, and, and so the mulch doesn't last as long. And then uh, probably greater nitrogen availability or greater mineralization of nitrogen from that cover crop uh, potentially helps stimulate weeds like pigweed that are sensitive to things like soil nitrates. Okay, so I want to transition here and now lay out what I see as some tangible goals for kind of employing cover crops as a proactive uh, resistance management tool. 
in, in really a herbicide based uh, system. And so uh, the first goal um, I would suggest is that we could be employing cover crops uh, that due to their competitive interactions reduces the size of emerged weed populations at the time of, of post herbicide applications, which uh, would have the effect of reducing the intensity of selection pressure on, on our currently effective post herbicides. Another tangible goal um, is to employ cover crops uh, in a manner that lengthen uh, application windows for effective control with post herbicides. So due to competitive interactions from the cover crop, if we're spraying smaller weeds more consistently, we're not exposing those weed populations to sublethal doses of herbicides, which has been linked to, to kind of creeping resistance uh, in, some, in some cases. And so the last goal is, um, which I think is probably more challenging in many scenarios, is to potentially intensify cover crop management in ways that permit reduc reductions in herbicide inputs, whether it be the number of passes or the number of AIs, which could help us to more effectively diversify or rotate modes of action uh, across crop rotations. All right, so let's um, let's put these goals in context with a couple in context with a couple of scenarios. So in Pennsylvania, uh, glyphosate and ALS resistant horseweed remains uh, really one of our primary challenges in no-till systems. And so our current best management practices are to consider two pass burn down programs that would include uh, either a fall or an early pre-plant application um, to use multiple effective sites of action in those burn down programs and then also to make sure we have a good soil applied residual uh, at planting. But in reality, um, the extend and enlist technologies are likely going to result in a lot of selection pressure on dicamba and 2,4-D on horseweed populations where uh, these best management practices are, are being ignored. So what happens when we throw cover crops into the mix? Um, so fall sown cover crops overlap with at least two of those three critical horseweed emergence periods that we that we uh, commonly see, so in the fall or early spring. And so if we prioritize uh, cover crop management in those systems, uh, the cover crops potentially can reduce selection pressure on, on those currently effective burn downs uh, by reducing the population that's exposed to the burn down. Um, we can also potentially lengthen the window for effective uh, pre-plant burn downs by reducing fall recruitment rates and, and spring growth rates of horseweed. Uh, and if we use cover crops effectively, we could potentially even eliminate the need for those two pass burn down programs. So, um, so we've been asking these types of questions in our work in Pennsylvania in the past couple of years, and, and these figures kind of summarized our earliest work on, on horseweed and, and, and cover crops. Uh, so we were looking at cover cropping strategies using seeding dates in this study that would be typical for after corn silage or small grains. So it's a little bit longer of a, of a cover crop growing season window. Uh, so we have more species available to us in this context. And the left panel shows the different cover crop species and their seeding rates uh, based on uh, pounds per acre. The X axis shows uh, the percent horseweed population decline in early May at the time of a pre-plant burn down application relative to a fallow control. And so you can see that across those uh, cover crops that we that we looked at, we were, we were getting about 45 to 90 percent suppression of horseweed at the time of a pre-plant burn down. And that cereal rye was really the most uh, suppressive cover crop uh, that we had uh, in those treatments. But when we did take species out of the equation and just looked at, looked at performance, what we found was that fall biomass production as well as fall ground cover were really the best predictors of, of horseweed suppression. So the right panel shows the distribution of horseweed uh, rosette sizes with, uh, within the cover crop treatments at the time of the pre-plant burn down. So here I'm just showing uh, the fallow control uh, in, the, in the top row compared to cereal rye across two different years. And what you can see is that uh, in the cereal rye cover crop, uh, we're reducing, we're not just reducing the population densities, we're also constraining the size of those individuals. So we're targeting smaller horseweed plants uh, with our burn down applications uh, when we've integrated cereal rye. So I wanted to broaden this a bit. Um, and so here I've summarized similar studies that have been done in, in different regions that looked at 
kind of cover cropping effects and, and different management tactics uh, for horse weed suppression or horse, horse weed control. So all these studies uh, ranged in the different uh, tactics they looked at, um, but they all measured horse weed densities relative to a cover crop control at the time or, or close to a burn down application timing. And so I think the key takeaway looking uh, at this summary is that all the studies saw pretty significant reductions in horse weed populations kind of at the high end for the best performing treatments, but they also saw um, a good bit of variability. And, and we can likely explain that variability. It's probably a function of either inconsistent performance of certain cover cropping tactics or even the same cover cropping tactic not performing consistently across uh, years or, or different soil environments. And so that, uh, that brings us back to thinking about how cover crops fit as a resistance management tool in an integrated system using an integrated approach. And I'm not gonna dive into these figures, but rather just highlight that some of the things that uh, we're doing here in Pennsylvania, and I know a number of my colleagues are also looking at, are uh, you know, really focusing on how we integrate cover crops and herbicides for horse weed control. So including fall herbicide burn down programs prior to the cover crop seeding, things like using uh, targeting horse weed with post applications in a cereal rye cover crop, uh, or looking at other tactics like the benefits of, of going with higher seeding rates, uh, particularly in those later fall uh, seasons or, or shorter cover crop uh, windows. Okay, so um, we're also asking the same type of questions when we're employing mulch residues to suppress summer annual weeds. Um, and so including some of our biggest challenges like pulmonary amaranth and, and water hemp. And so the resistance management goals here for using cover crops uh, would be similar. We want to reduce the selection pressure on currently effective host options by reducing weed populations at the time of, of herbicide exposure. We want to lengthen windows for effective on-label uh, post applications that so we're targeting smaller weeds. And this is really important, uh, particularly imp important for Palmer and, and water hemp management. Uh, and then also we're relying right now uh, very heavily on just a few modes of action in these multiple past systems that use overlapping residuals uh, to control these species. So potentially uh, using cover crops to reduce total herbicide inputs or move selection pressure away from some of these uh, residual herbicides is probably an important long-term uh, goal that we should be targeting. Uh, so I'm, I'm just going to lean on a couple good studies uh, from the Midwest and Mid-South uh, here that focused on integrating cover crops and, and herbicide programs to manage Palmer and water hemp. So the, the first study, uh, which our hosts Mark and, and Bill led with a number of extension weed scientists in the, in the Midwest and, and Mid-South, was uh, uh, really focused on integrating cereal rye or other cover crops um, with uh, with herbicide programs. And so uh, that's that's kind of the summary is is there in the upper right hand corner this particular figure, um, and so what they found was that integrating cereal rye did significantly reduce Palmer densities, but what was important and came out of this uh, uh, number of studies is that uh, we still needed two or three pass uh, herbicide programs with post and residuals to really achieve full season control, regardless of whether a cover crop was used or not. Um, the bottom right figure uh, summarizes an important finding from uh, a study conducted in Tennessee by Larry Steckel's group, uh, which found that delaying termination of, of a hairy vetch and winter wheat cover crop from 14 days pre-plant, which is kind of the standard uh, BMP, to a planting green approach where you're terminating the cover crop uh, either at planting or, or seven days after planting, expanded that application window in which you're able to target uh, uh, your post applications on small Palmer plants by about a week. And so uh, that's, that's pretty significant when we talk about making effective post applications on, on Palmer. So again, I think the take home here is that cover crops can be effective um, as a tool for resistance management, but we really need to continue to understand how we integrate uh, these cover cropping approaches uh, with, the, uh, with effective uh, herbicide programs. So what, what's the what's the future look like? I, I would suggest that the really the most consistent way to increase cover crop biomass production and, and therefore 
total weed suppression potential is by uh, figuring out how to negotiate the agronomic trade-offs related to delaying cover crop termination. And so there's a lot of interest uh, in my region right now and some adoption of plants and green pra practices by farmers. Um, and there's also a lot of uh, interest by industry in, in new equipment technologies that can help improve residue management in these systems. So, through, so different uh, uh, different attachments to planters, and, and all of this is going to really have important implications on how we manage weeds and how we can effectively uh, use these uh, cover crop mulch systems uh, as a resistance management tool. And then uh, finally, if we do see more use of these high residue cover crop systems, if it becomes more adopted, um, it's likely going to create some challenges when it comes to herbicide management, particularly the use of, of soil applied residuals, uh, which are, are currently our most effective uh, resistance management strategy. And so I know that a number of my colleagues are, are working to understand these types of interactions between residual herbicides and high risk cover crops to come up with some best management practices for, for integrating these approaches. So just to summarize, um, uh, so, you know, hopefully this talk has demonstrated that cover crops um, can be a resistance management tool um, and we should be considering about, uh, consider ways that we can adopt uh, cover cropping really as a proactive approach that's going to help slow or delay resistance in the future. Um, and, but, when, you know, this approach, I think it comes with a learning curve, certainly cover crop adoption and, and, and playing cover crops for, for weed suppression. There's a learning curve and, it, and we need to learn how to adapt cover cropping to local conditions using some of these key management principles. Um, and so I'll end there, uh, Bill, and just uh, wanted to acknowledge a couple uh, key contributors to a lot of that Northeastern work as well as some uh, funding agencies. And I'll turn it back to you. Okay, uh, thanks John and, and thanks Tom as well. Um, great presentations, a great set of information for, from both of you guys. Uh, we, we do have a few questions that, that popped up here as, as you guys went through your presentations. And so I, I think what I'll do is I'll, I'll go back to Tom and, uh, and pose a question or two to Tom and then uh, John, we've got a question or two for you as well. Um, so, so Tom, um, are, are you uh, are you back online and live? Yes, yes okay. I am. I'm listening. Okay, good deal. All right. So Tom, since uh, you you made it made it very clear that our weeds need to be uh, well hydrated for the electrical methods to work, do we know anything about soil moisture limits that would be needed to make it work? And I'm thinking uh, as as a management tactic, can we use something like tensiometers to determine when our soil moisture levels levels are so low? that we, we would have a pretty good idea that the weeds wouldn't be well hydrated enough to make it effective? Yeah, I, uh, that's a great question, Bill. And, and I would say that we're still at the early stage here of learning. So we're not as sophisticated to say that we need a certain moisture level or we um, actively use machinery to measure moisture levels. It's, it's more of a rule of thumb now, Bill, where, where uh, producers will look for a rainfall event, and even if the field is still wet, um, there's all kinds of stories about, boy, you should see it spark or light up when you have a lot of moisture in the air or on the ground. So they're trying to target the application on, hyd on, you know, on, on plants that are well hydrated, but they also have to be careful about the conditions for the field because we still have to get the equipment through the field. So it's a compromise between um, after a rainfall event, but still being able to properly operate the equipment. Okay, all right, okay, yeah, that's, uh, that, that's good feedback there. Um, so, so John, I'm, I'm gonna jump to you here. Um, so John, um, early in your presentation, you, you made it very clear that, that with high biomass, um, cover crops, particularly cereal rye and cereal rye with radish, um, we can do a great job of, of suppressing mare's tail or horseweed. And we've certainly seen that in the central corn belt or eastern corn belt as well. Um, but you also made it pretty clear that um, um, under, no, under low nitrogen fertility levels that we don't get quite as much biomass production. 
So do you think we should be considering um, nitrogen fertilizer when we use a, a, a cereal rye or a cereal rye radish mixture uh, cover crop and we're attempting to get um, high biomass production for weed suppression? Well, that's a good question, Bill, and, and that's come up before in our region and it's, it's not something uh, that we would really advocate because we're really concerned about nutrient management and, and nitrogen management, particularly uh, in the Chesapeake Bay. And so um, I, I think it's more important just to recognize, uh, you know, the context of the rotations, those spot, spots in the rotations where you are going to potentially, uh, you know, not have have the residual nitrogen fertility and in those scenarios um, there are a few things you can go go to higher seeding rates uh, certainly try to trying to get in earlier in the fall can help make up for some of that uh, uh, difference um, and you know I, I think the other thing is is you know that's fairly particular to horse weeds so we we have a lot of fall emergence uh, you know, in, in some spring emergence in our region. And so the quicker that we can get ground cover in the fall, the better we're off we're going to be. Um, and so that's we that's where we see the nitrogen fertility come, come in as an important factor. Um, but you can, if you're thinking about growing a big cover crop to use it as a mulch uh, in a kind of a rolled system, um, you know, perhaps the the total amount of ground cover that you're getting in the fall might not be as big of a deal. Okay, all right. Uh, Tom, I, I'm gonna jump back to you. Um, Tom, did uh, you might have mentioned this in your presentation, uh, but could you uh, refresh our memory if, if uh, you didn't mention it? Um, how many acres per hour can be covered with the, the newer electricity unit? That's an excellent question, and I, I wish I could have said that that I stated it and you missed it. I didn't state it, Bill, so I'm gonna state it now. So the business model that some of the producers are using is 20 acres an hour, okay? They wanna okay. get over 20 acres an hour and they believe that they have to travel between four and five miles an hour to accomplish that. Now you could say, well, why not just drive seven miles an hour? You can do more acres. And I want to state it again that when you're touching weeds, you're actively using power. And that's, that is creating, uh, it's generating heat. It's potentially fatiguing the equipment. And I think there's, there's a compromise that we've learned here between um, um, managing the temperature of the equipment and also effectively using the equipment in the field. And I might add that on the new, on the weed zapper equipment, there is a, a display in the cab where you can measure generation, generator temperature, voltage, amps, and wattage on the go. So you're able to see what's, what's occurring as you operate the equipment. Okay, all right. Um, so, John, I've got another question for you. So, uh, again, very clear message that horseweed suppression with high biomass crops is, is very effective. Um, if, if we can get biomass production out of broadleaf uh, crops, we, if we can get just as much biomass production out of broadleaf cover crops as we can with grass cover crops, do you think that the horseweed suppression would, would be similar? Well, so I, I you know, in our work, the, the one broadleaf that we we saw um, provided really high levels of horse weed suppression was forage radish, and so we were actually to we were able to dial back the CRI seeding rates when we had radish in the mix, um, and 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 achieve similar levels of suppression. There's a couple of trade-offs there because uh, you know forage radish winter kills in our our region. I've also um, gone away from forage radish because my colleague uh, in entomology has demonstrated that slugs uh, really like uh, forage radish, which so that can be a problem uh, later the next spring. Um, and, you know, the other broadleafs, the legumes um, that you might uh, try, they typically, they're slow starters. So they don't, uh, you know, things like hairy vetch really come on in, in late spring and we don't get a lot of biomass production in the fall. And so 
I think with horseweed, it just it probably depends on if you're getting the biggest slug of horseweed coming up in spring and early into the cash crop growing season. And I think uh, having those, you know, having a legume in the mix, uh, there there might be a benefit. Uh, but in our region, where it's the biggest slug is in the fall, um, we want to we want to have the best fall performers, which are, are typically the, the winter cereals. Okay. All right. Thank you. Okay. Uh, I think that's all the questions that we have for now. So this wraps up today's presentation. A recording of this webinar will be available on the Take Action website within one week. Uh, join us next week, next Thursday, for another webinar. Um, Dr. Young and myself will be discussing a couple of different topics. Uh, Dr. Young will be discussing, doc, uh, excuse me, drift reduction agents, um, key considerations for pre-plant and burn down herbicides, and uh, volunteer quarter control will be the topics that that I'll be hitting on. So again, look for an announcement on Twitter and various social media outlets, and uh, we look forward to, uh, to to talking to you guys again next week.